can I invite my co-facilitator, Dr. Devendra Kandait, to please join me? All right. So. Um, I can. I can. Okay. I can. Thank you. So De okay, <laughs> Devendra is our country lead for um, the UP health systems work, human resources for health, our frontline worker initiative. So, so he's he's. Uh, He's the, the, the leader of, of many of our... My job is this. Yes, okay. <laughs> so I'd like to first invite um, Dr. Catherine Semrau, who is director of the Better Birth Program at Ariadne Labs. Dr. Semrau has over 15 years of experience in the fields of maternal and child health and epidemiology. Her research has focused on the prevention of maternal and child mortality, improvements of uh, quality of care, and the prevention of mother-to-child transmission of HIV. So I'm very um, excited to have Catherine come and talk to us about the lessons learned from the Better Birth Trial. Sorry, there, there's the specific question. So Catherine, many of us have, uh, probably most of us have read the New England Journal of Medicine article which reported on the outcomes of the Better Birth Trial. So what we've asked you to do is to reflect on the lessons that you've learned from the study. What did you find worked well? What didn't work so well? And importantly, what are the factors that were operating at the level of the health system, the facility, as well as at the level of the individual providers that would have, uh, that you think might have influenced the outcomes? Sure. So thank you very much um, for the opportunity to come and share a little bit about our work from the Better Birth Trial in Uttar Pradesh. Um, as I noted here on the slide, there's a team of 300 behind me that made this trial possible, including my co-principal investigator, Dr. Vishwajit Kumar, who's here, as well as colleagues back in the States and in UP. So just quickly, for those of you that don't actually know the trial or haven't read um, the paper that Sunita alluded to, the Better Birth trial was conducted in UP from November 2014 until January this last year, 2017 focused on testing and effectiveness of an intervention that was a peer coaching model focused on the WHO safe childbirth checklist implementation and asking the question, is it effective on improving adherence of birth attendants on the quality of care and does it reduce mortality, specifically perinatal mortality, maternal mortality and maternal morbidity in the first seven days postpartum. This map shows the 24 districts that we worked in across UP, and we followed nearly 160,000 mother-infant pairs across those 120 sites. So this is a busy slide demonstrating the intervention itself, but just to highlight that the WHO Safe Childbirth Checklist is already part of the Maternal uh, Newborn Health Toolkit here in India as part of the policy, and we use an engage launch support model that focused on having providers, external peer coaches, so nurses coaching nurses, physicians coaching physicians, to provide high quality of care using the checklist as a guiding framework of the behaviors that should be adhered to. I should note in our intervention, we did not provide supplies and we did not conduct skills training, rather activated the local uh, context. So if there was a lady medical officer to conduct training or activate the local supply system that should be used uh, to improve quality of care. So after two months of the intervention, just briefly, we saw that in the control sites out of 18 basic practices, so things that should be done from admission until one hour postpartum, things like blood pressure assessment for the woman, temperature taking for the baby within the first hour, skin-to-skin uh, -skin initiation or oxytocin use. So just those first practices. Out of those 18 practices in the control sites, only seven and a half were delivered on average to the woman. Whereas in the intervention sites, we saw about 13 of the practices adhered to in most cases after two months of the intervention. So after two months of coaching and the use of the checklist. At 12 months, so after the intervention had completed, uh, we see that in the intervention arm in the blue on the right hand side of the slide, you still see a significant increase compared to the control sites, but you start to see a tapering off in behaviors and return to 
um, previous practices. So we see improvements in the basic practices, but as Runal mentioned earlier when he showed this slide to you, we did not see an impact on mor mortality. We didn't see a difference in perinatal mortality, maternal mortality, or maternal morbidity. But one thing I would like to highlight here across these 120 sites, each dot on the slide represents one facility. You see dramatic heterogeneity in these mortality rates and mor morbidity rates across the state of UP where we were working. So we got the results and started to ask why. Why was there no impact on mortality if we saw this dramatic improvement in adherence to practices? And we are very fortunate across this very large randomized control trial that we literally have 204 million data points that we have been investigating from qualitative and quantitative work and have come up with 10 major themes or areas that we are seeing as disruptors or reasons why we did not see impact on mortality. So the way to read this little XY graph is on the X axis, excuse me, on the Y axis uh, with looking at potential impact. So where do we think we would have the most impact if we uh, affected these results? If we affected, for example, timely referral or safe transportation of patients, if we improved provider skill level, we think that could have a big change on mortality and morbidity. And on the y-axis, you'll see the, the data richness, and that is out of the trial itself. So while we think that antenatal and postnatal care may have a big impact, we just don't have a lot of information from it, from the trial, because we were focused on the time around labor and delivery. So today, what I'd like to give you is just some little tidbits of information, of data, focused particularly around the timely referral and safe transportation of patients and provider skill level as well as some information about the provider patient communication, facility infrastructure, and staffing. And then give you some of the high level lessons learned that we have coming out of the data right now. A lot of this is preliminary. We're still working through our data sets and we'll have um, more complete messaging towards the end of this year. So first of all, I want to go back to Munal's uh, point earlier today to think about from the perspective of the provider, from the perspective of the mother, you first have to know who they are. So in these sites, across the 120 sites, the average birth attendant was 37 years old with nine years of experience. But of note, it had been four years since their last training. And that is either in-service training or out-of-facility training provided by an external NGO or the government. As many of you know, staff nurses are providing the majority of labor and delivery care. And we were surprised when we interviewed 603 birth attendants across the 120 sites that only 45% of them had actually received the formal skilled birth attendant training. And when we asked them about their preclinical experience, we noted the quote here is representative of several of women that we spoke to, that even in their internships, in their preclinical training, they may have heard the theory of how to deliver a baby, but had never actually conducted a delivery during their labor and during their preclinical training or had never seen complications and delivered their very first baby at the facility where they were hired to go work. So there's a lot of learning on the job that's happening and picking up whatever practices are the norm, the cultural norm in that labor and delivery unit. Now, not surprising, we see that this kind of care carries over into the quality of care. I think we've all recognized, partially from the framework conversation this morning, as well as the work that you all have done, we know that high-risk women or problems or complications have to be identified, and then there has to be action taken to actually make an impact on morbidity and mortality. So in about just over 2,000 women that had their deliveries observed by independent data collectors, this is after the intervention has been completed, we see that, first of all, blood pressure measurement is only happening in about 3% of the women in the control sites and about 40% of the women in the intervention sites, which it's good to see that it's improved, but it's nowhere near what it needs to be. And when the blood pressure was measured, about 3% of women were identified as having a high BP. And that's 17 total women. And out of those 17 women, only one woman received magnesium sulfate, and only one woman was referred on to higher level care. To us in the group that has been analyzing this data, we see this as indicating areas of intervention that focus on the clinical skills of the birth attendants, the ability to identify 
the problem, the empowerment to prescribe drugs and, and give them in the facility, the ability to make decisions about referral, and also there's a whole supplies chain cascade that's associated with this kind of care to be provided. Not only does it have to do with the birth attendant, it also has to do with the mom and her connection from the community into the facility itself. So in the cohort of 160,000 women who were enrolled in the trial, the average age was 25 years, and most women already had two children. But these mean and median times from admission to the facility until the time of delivery is extremely short. So it's a very short time for the woman to have a complication that's identified and managed and then referred on to a higher level, higher level care. We should also note that across the study, only 2% of the women in this study had a C-section, which is extremely low compared to what we would have expected. As noted earlier, the first referral units, we had 18 out of the 120 sites that were first referral units in the trial. Even though they should have been able to conduct C-sections, none of them were conducting uh, emergency C-sections, and only two were conducting elective C-sections. We do see that birth attendants are identifying risks or identifying complications. About 10% of the women in the trial had an identified and documented complication, so that may be something like eclampsia, hemorrhage, or it may have been a low birth weight infant. Out of that broader cohort, again, of the 157,000 women, 9% had a complication that warranted referral. We worked with some OBGYNs and neonatologists to figure out which ones probably should have been referred out of these lower level facilities. But as you can see, only 61% were referred and 40, nearly 40% 40 of the women were not sent to higher level care. And we think that has a big impact with respect to mortality rates. So this is a little bit of a complicated slide, but the way to read it across the left is there's 160,000 women in that large purple circle. Where they came to deliver, so women came to a primary health center, community health center, or FRU as their first level of care. You will notice that the maternal mortality rate in this, I'm sorry, the colors didn't turn out. On the left bubble, where it says 13, 21, and 32, that is the maternal mortality and on the right bubble is the perinatal mortality. You'll note that the perinatal mortality is not different across health facility um, levels or levels of care. We also noted that about 6% of women were referred out and that is consistent no matter what level of care women are going to. So again, that first referral unit is not necessarily able to provide the level of care that they are supposed to be able to. And again, you can see that the mortality rates are much higher among those referred out, which is not surprising, obviously, because you're referring out those with complications. But clearly, if we're going to have an impact on maternal and perinatal mortality, this is an area of intervention that needs to be focused on. On this slide, we also noted that women have quite the odyssey that they are following across, um, uh, across the healthcare system. Out of 149 maternal deaths that happened in the trial, we went back and listened to phone calls to find out what happened to them. I apologize for the coloring on the slide. I realize it may be hard to read. On the left-hand side, there's 101 women, who, of all who died, but we traced their footsteps across the healthcare system. And you can see that many of the women were identified as having a complication and referred out, but then many of them move across multiple health systems, multiple facilities, often looking for an OBGYN or a blood bank or a place that has both. 20% of the women died in transit um, out of those 101 that we, that we were able to trace through, identifying the need for stabilization for, before getting on medical transport and then having the ability to actually manage the care on the transport itself. So in, I have two summary slides to highlight. So first, out of the trial, I think what we learned is that the checklist acts as a great organizing tool and framework to identify supplies that are needed, behaviors that need to be adhered to for the provider themselves. Peer coaching was an important lesson learned for us as well, that it needed to be nurse to nurse and physician to physician. In other parts of India, in the original um, pilot study, they actually had physician to nurse coaching and that worked well in Karnataka. That did not work well in our pilot studies here in Uttar Pradesh. 
We noted that the checklist and the peer coaching did improve practices, but we did not get to the levels of adherence that we need to to make impact on mortality. And we also noted, as I showed you in several of the slides here, that complication management was not at the level it needs to be. This did not overcome the issues with supply availability, the provider skills levels, um, empowerment for decision making, so who has the rights and responsibilities for that, and also we did not deal with accountability and incentives in ways that I think we should in the next iteration of this kind of intervention. Now in the beginning I showed you a slide with 10 different themes of areas that are popping up for us and this is just a summary of what we have found so far. Um, again, I'd welcome feedback on these as we're continuing to conduct further data analysis. So first of all, in this cohort, we noted that risk stratification and identification of women early um, upon their admission at the facility is limited and the referral system is not conducive to getting them to the highest le the level of care that they need quickly and efficiently. We also see that the skills and adherence to evidence-based practices is quite inconsistent. There are some facilities that had very, very high levels of adherence and seem to um, be able to provide high, quote unquote, quality of care from the clinical perspective. But that wasn't true everywhere. And you see a lot of heterogeneity across the sites. We are now starting to unpack through the verbal autopsy work that we've been doing in some peri uh, perinatal deaths, as well as um, qualitative interviews, trying to understand more about the incentives, whether they are financial or otherwise, that are leading, between, leading to misalignment between the expectations of the provider, the performance of the provider, and the expectations of the family themselves. Fourth, we saw that supply availability in these sites was actually quite good. About 80 to 85 percent of the supplies required were available, but they're not actually always being used during the labor and delivery process as expected. I think a point that Murnal raised earlier about this need for leadership is so critical. So making sure that there's a leader at the facility who is interested and engaged in this kind of work and has a supportive environment in order to make quality improvement effective. I think if we had had more leadership engagement, um, it would have been helpful. We also recognize that this particular intervention is focused immediately on the time from admission until the time the woman is discharged and goes home. So that continuity of care, so what happens to her in the antenatal setting, what happens to her in that postnatal setting, I think is really um, an area for intervention going forward because we didn't see that there's, women are not staying at the health facility for a long period of time to be checked for their own health or that of the baby's health. And then finally, we're seeing that the patient provider communications are quite suboptimal. When we timed um, how long did it take for birth attendants to describe family planning in the postnatal period to women, they spent 30 seconds to 45 seconds on average explaining family planning and typically one option was given. So we're not seeing that there's a dialogue that's happening, it's just information is being given to women and they're not necessarily able to um, retain it, take it on, especially in that very early postnatal period. So clearly I think one of the things about Better Birth is that there are a lot of lessons to be learned out of the trial. Obviously we are all here in hopes of making quality of care better for women and the newborns and preventing mortality and morbidity and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. That was excellent. Um, yeah. Uh, sure. I, okay. This is time to invite the uh, second colleague, uh, Sanjeev Kumar. Dr. Sanjeev Kumar is a senior uh, clinical team leader in UPTSU uh, and he is leading the implementation of facility place based clinical interventions. Sanjeev, the questions are what is the progress made? Um, what are the efforts that are going on? What are the still challenges and difficult areas difficult to influence? And what are the new innovations which you are trying? Uh, thank you, Devin. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak about the mentoring intervention in uh, state of Uttar Pradesh. So uh, before I start my presentation, I'll just uh, go uh, give a quick brief of uh, how we started this particular intervention. 
So uh, we started nurse mentoring program in Uttar Pradesh in 2014. And uh, so we also had some learning from uh, a Karnataka Sukshama project of a similar intervention. And based on that learning and then uh, with UP context, we modified uh, the program. And uh, uh, so, and this is how we actually started the nurse mentoring program. So uh, in year 2013, we have conducted a gap assessment and that clearly showed us uh, the uh, kind of uh, uh, in-house, uh, like in-service training, like SBA training, the percentage was so low, it, is, was, it was lesser than 30%. And uh, the, the, uh, the deployment, rational deployment of uh, these trained people was also not there. Like uh, uh, the staff nurse and this ANMs who are trained on SBA training, they were posted in uh, a low delivery load, load facilities or other facilities. So that was uh, the kind of insight which we had uh, in uh, 2013. And this also built us uh, the strategy of nurse mentoring program in state of uh, Uttar Pradesh. So in this presentation, I'll be talking about the uh, kind of uh, strategy of uh, nurse mentoring program, as well as the progress update and uh, some of the essential uh, key uh, uh, data element which uh, 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 from our external evaluation data and uh, the way forward and recommendation which I'll be talking about. So uh, uh, as you all know, uh, the Uttar Pradesh, the population is more than 200 million. So our idea was how exactly we can improve the uh, availability of quality reproductive uh, maternal, newborn, child health and adolescent health services in uh, public health facilities. So we started in uh, the intervention in 25 high priority districts and uh, approximately the population of 69 million. And within these high priority districts, we selected 100 uh, focused block, which covers approximately 29 million population. And uh, uh, almost three times the population of the government norm, uh, e e each of these blocks. So like all the blocks are a very big block where these nurse mentor intervention we have implemented. And through this intervention, we covered approximately, uh, or you can say the indirectly 30,000 deliveries and uh, uh, around 230 odd facilities we uh, directly mentored through these nurse mentoring approach. And uh, these are the number of uh, staff nurses and a &M who have been uh, the primary beneficiaries of these mentoring intervention. And they are not just uh, uh, from uh, health facilities, the, some of the, like the a &Ms are also from outreach uh, uh, site because uh, the, uh, the quality antenatal checkup through VHND was also our, the target uh, point for uh, doing this intervention. So, uh, I mean, what is nurse mentoring in UP context? So, uh, so, we, uh, so these are the new cadre of uh, uh, nurses and all of them are either BSCs or MSc graduate, trained on the clinical skills and quality improvement process in primary healthcare uh, setup. So we uh, identify these uh, nurses from outside, so they are not uh, uh, from a government health system, so they are from outside, and they are freshers. So what we expected them to do, so we expected them uh, 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 to deliver the clinical competencies to these service providers and also build a kind of a system uh, related work on uh, these uh, five uh, uh, critical component. So we call uh, them like, uh, so it was, the program was like, uh, we started with RM and CHA, but for in, in phase one, we prioritize uh, the intrapartum care through this nurse mentoring uh, approach. And uh, this is a kind of a five into five uh, 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 matrix for these nurse mentors, which is like uh, different from the government of India, five into five matrix, but for their own work. So the five essential clinical competency which we targeted, and then five uh, uh, system-related work uh, on uh, infection, biomedical waste, and then uh, essential drugs, referral, community uh, interaction, and then uh, finally the doc improved documentation. So, and uh, what we expected them to do, uh, on the right side you can just uh, uh, see the summary of uh, those uh, component. So we wanted to build a repo and form a quality improvement team so that a regular uh, facility action plan and follow-up can be done uh, through this approach. The second big component is our on-site mentoring within their own facilities. So the block uh, uh, facilities and the uh, provider from those uh, particular block and other delivery point within that block was mentored in their own workplace. So that was the key for uh, doing this kind of a mentoring activities uh, through nurse mentors. 
and then how exactly we engage the whole uh, uh, the leaders from a facility as well as from the district to review the progress of uh, uh, those uh, uh, component and finally we added uh, the additional support team for uh, all the difficult uh, and high load facilities where uh, we really find some challenges of uh, improving the quality of care in those particular facilities so uh, this is how uh, we uh, did the mentoring intervention. I mean, from starting from left, I mean, we recruited uh, 100 uh, BSc and MSc nurses, and almost all of them are from UP. So, in fact, we at the beginning we didn't know that we get every uh, person from a UP, but somehow we got all the nurses from UP. Some of the nurses who are not from UP, they are also well Hindi speak spoken uh, nurses, and they all are freshers and they have just recently con uh, completed their BSc or MSc courses. So a very little experience of conducting deliveries. So we uh, trained them rigorously uh, during that period. So I mean that's the duration of the training to these mentor was uh, five weeks. So we wanted them to uh, train on every aspect of these maternal and newborn healthcare and also uh, uh, experience some of the uh, deliveries uh, uh, in uh, public health facilities before we send these you know, mentors to the public health facilities for mentoring of the senior staff nurses as well as a &M. So, uh, So that was the kind of a training which we did and then we also developed some kind of a job aids and tools so that you know, we get uh, some support uh, in terms of uh, their deliverables. The first one was like self-assessment tool. We really want the facility to do, assess themselves and make an action plan based on that, I mean, uh, uh, that assessment approach. And then we introduced the case sheet. And this is the time when uh, there was no case sheet in the state of Uttar Pradesh. There was just one page uh, bedhead ticket, which uh, was used to capture the information from uh, those things. So case sheet was also introduced. And it acted as not just to improve document part, but also have a kind of a job aid for them to learn and uh, do the things. And then uh, the facility action plan uh, in those facilities and then uh, referral directory and quality tracker. So referral directory is we try to make some kind of a document in the each facility so that where and uh, how far uh, they want to refer any given complication from maternal and newborn health component. The fourth component was establishment of mini skill lab. So when we uh, started this mentoring intervention, there was no lab in uh, kind of a skill lab in uh, uh, UP. There was a, just a single lab in uh, state capital in Lucknow, but periphery there was no such lab. And establishing a lab is like a, a big task. It's like establishing a big infrastructure and big unit at uh, any uh, given uh, facility in uh, UP. So, uh, so we uh, discuss with the government and have a kind of in a small lab within the block level facility. So that really bring uh, the kind of uh, uh, on-site mentoring by these provider because we had an ex earlier experience of uh, the SBA training where uh, from all high load delivery point, it is very difficult to move these uh, staff uh, for a few days to train on the, another skill lab. So why not have a kind of a lab within their own facility, a smaller lab, so that the mentoring and the kind of a training can be uh, perform in the, their own uh, workplace and uh, and then that quality improvement team because uh, this whole team uh, along with the government uh, leaders they make a quality improvement team and uh, uh, so that really facilitate the process of uh, 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 the quality improvement in the own facilities and then finally uh, the regular mentoring uh, uh, in field by TSU and government of UP to see and uh, support the nurse mentor as well as the whole team uh, within the districts to uh, perform on that uh, area. So I mean this is the kind of uh, uh, the process which we followed and then uh, so I'll just quickly show you uh, some of the data. I mean data is from uh, Sambodhi quality of care survey. Uh, on left side, so uh, the data is from Sambodhi quality of care and right side, we also have some data of, on complication uh, identification and the overall outcome of those complication from uh, facility registers and referral registers. So we have also uh, captured these data on a regular basis and, and uh, this is what it looks like. So on left side, I mean, you can see that first one component is about the rapid assessment of women when they arrive in the facilities. So there is a significant uh, improvement in uh, <coughs> 
nurse mentoring facilities around 30 to 40 percent improvement in uh, the BP uh, measurement as well as th the fetal heart rate uh, measurement and uh, case sheet initiation has also uh, uh, have shown uh, the kind of uh, progress in these areas. So just let me uh, give you the clarity that these, these uh, the, uh, data are from year 2015 and year 2016. 16. So the two year of uh, uh, data. So <coughs> and uh, if you see the active management of third stage of labor, uh, so there are huge improvement in all the three component and if you see the uh, all three components so the difference in difference is almost 26 uh, I mean that clearly shows that uh, uh, all the three component together has a clear advantage in these mentoring facilities uh, for active management of third stage of labor and I mean going towards the right side if you see the complication identification so when we started our intervention identification of uh, those maternal complication was so low so somewhere around five to six percent so that really improved <coughs> and uh, the bar also uh, tells us the kind of a case sheet uh, filling uh, in these particular facilities because initially there was a very resistance of filling those particular uh, case sheet but somehow uh, in this period this has really improved uh, uh, the kind of a quality filling of uh, this case sheet and finally uh, the outcome of PPH complication you can also see uh, the kind of a survival and uh, uh, for those PPH complication cases has also gone from 40% uh, to 70% uh, and uh, within that their own facilities and uh, overall outcome is uh, has improved over a period of time. And same is with the uh, newborn care, uh, uh, <coughs> the newborn care, uh, whether it is a skin to skin care or early initiation of breastfeeding and weighing, in all the area, uh, the improvement is around 30 to 40 percent in all these nurse mentoring facilities. And, uh, and similar with uh, this complication also, uh, the <coughs> from 6 percent to 19 percent, even uh, for newborn complication, the complication identification uh, rate was very low at the beginning, so they never report any complication at uh, initial period of time, but later on this has really improved. And if you also see on down uh, right side, the outcome of those birth asphyxia uh, has also shown uh, uh, much improvement within their own facilities. So previously they used to refer all the cases of birth asphyxia, but later on they try to manage most of the cases of birth asphyxia and because we understand that referral of uh, birth asphyxia cases has a lot of uh, problem because uh, the baby is going to die in uh, uh, minutes. So and any referral uh, hospital distance in UP is more than half an hour and when you are sending a case, such case to uh, higher facilities, so the outcome uh, will be um, bad. <coughs> yes. Okay. So these are the some of the program challenges uh, which we faced in uh, uh, during phase one, like uh, hemoglobin estimation at the time of arrival, partograph initiation, complication, uh, receiving complication, uh, and the peripheral management. So complication management at district hospital because that time we uh, were working at primary healthcare facilities. So this was the another challenges which we faced while referring a case to a higher facilities. And finally, postpartum monitoring and duration of postnatal stay. And on right side, you see some of the system related challenges, which also came across uh, 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 the phase one intervention. Now, this is my last slide. So that's some of the recommendation and on, on down, I'll be talking briefly about uh, uh, how exactly we want to move ahead on uh, uh, the scale up plan and the innovation component. So uh, nurse, ment <coughs> nurse mentor is re uh, required whether it is from outside or inside. So this is the, my first recommendation that our mentoring uh, has to happen on a longer duration. So it is not like uh, uh, so couple of or few doses of mentoring will uh, do the necessary changes. So, uh, so that is the first recommendation. And so second is uh, the, uh, having a standardized case sheet. So now government of India has also uh, implemented their own case sheet and which is quite similar of what case sheet we have implemented. And good that uh, <coughs> it is already uh, the provider has already aware of uh, filling those quality case sheets. So in UP, nobody is talking about uh, now one pager uh, bed head tickets. So now everybody is aware of uh, some six to seven pager or of a case sheet, or having a kind of an improved documentation as well as working as a job aid. And finally, quality improvement process. So this quality improvement, 
we do have an experience of having a quality improvement team working on a uh, kind of a facility action plan as well as follow up of those action plan so recently the lux uh, uh, initiative which was implemented also strongly says about the uh, quality circle within the facility and the district coaching team having a similar protocol so that will also uh, give a uh, kind of a good uh, uh, update and then find the tracking of uh, pre referral management and outcome of those complications so morning minnal also talk about the uh, vertical integration this uh, will add a kind of a uh, quality wise to improve the vertical integration component uh, when we go ahead on that particular component and finally having a some kind of a lab in their own facility so that uh, the on site mentoring and regular uh, things can be taken care of so just a quick uh, the scale okay. up in the innovations okay. uh, section of, of, uh, of our uh, mm -hmm. teams. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the scale up is uh, uh, the UP uh, is, uh, is going with uh, the 100 uh, TSU block with their own uh, mentoring approach. So the UP is funding that particular component. The remaining 620 blocks. So UP constitute 820 uh, blocks. So remaining 620 blocks has a similar methodology of nurse mentoring program with uh, their own um, uh, staff becoming a mentor. So that's the kind of uh, uh, scale up plan which is happening. So two things which we are adding here is one is uh, uh, the FRU intervention through regional resource training center through which we want to engage the doctors and specialists in um, uh, the mentoring approach. And finally, we are also implementing the um, MNH boost where we want to uh, do the kind of uh, understanding the barrier and facilitator how to improve the outcome of those maternal and newborn health. Thank you. Thank you so much. Clearly, with the, uh, the scale up of nurse mentoring, I think the, the conversations we're having here today around how to really effectively um, uh, you know, support the human resources um, investments for quality of care become absolutely critical. So if I can invite Michelle. Michelle Kermode is head of the maternal and reproductive health um, is head of maternal and reproductive health at the Nossal Institute for Global Health at uh, the University of Melbourne. Her research has been in the fields of HIV, sexual and reproductive health, mental health, and women's health in low and middle income countries. She's worked extensively with partners um, from India and more recently from Kenya. So Michelle, you've been engaged in a comparative process evaluation of quality improvement programs in Uttar Pradesh and Bihar and programs specifically focused on facility-based um, birth attendance. Uh, we would like for you to comment on the emerging findings from, these, uh, from the study. What are the common threads running through these different programs in terms of what's working as well as what we may need to address in order to boost their effectiveness and impact? Thank you, Senator, and good morning, everyone. Um, as Sunita mentioned, we've been involved in a comparative process evaluation involving three nurse mentoring programs, uh, UPTSU, Bihar TSU, and the Better Births program. And so I really would like to, first of all, thank the leadership of those three programs for their collegiality and for their um, enormous support with the logistics of our own data gathering when they're already very busy people themselves. I also just want to point out that Shika Basin from Pup Council and Partner Dayal from our institute, the Nossal Institute, I've also been very key in, in this process. And so what I'm about to present is uh, some of the learnings from a compar our comparative process evaluation. And this is only preliminary learnings because it's an ongoing process. And really, it's um, nothing that you don't already know because, in fact, you know, the preliminary synthesis of this is just feeding back what many of you who we've interviewed have told us. I'm going to give you the headlines, not the details, and also want to acknowledge before I start that these learnings capitalise on the benefit of hindsight. So they may have some relevance to current programs, but are probably have more salience for programs that might happen in the future. So I had in my mind uh, these questions when I was preparing this presentation. How might we further improve the standard of maternal and newborn care at the time of delivery? How can we maximise the value of the nurse mentor role to achieve this? So this is my number one message. Context is everything. Um, interventions in complex settings will encounter unanticipated problems and unintended consequences. We can't know everything up front. 
So a flexible and responsive design is ideal to try and manage some of those things that we can't anticipate. Also consultation and involvement of end users uh, in the design process and the monitoring evaluation, even re representation. Obviously you can't talk to everybody. Um, but especially in the case of the nurse mentoring programs, the health facility staff and the birth attendants. Another point that's very clear is that behaviour change depends on what happens within and between people. Of course, there has to be an intervention, but the intervention alone doesn't bring about the change. It's what happens inside people and between people that creates the change, and that's often nuanced, hidden and difficult to measure. And so having a rich understanding of context, doing formative work that will invite a rich understanding of context is important. So we would want to understand what is the nurse's world? What is the patient's world? And the more broad brush issues of gender and power. And then maybe some very specific questions such as what's currently happening in the labour room? What, how might the intervention impact on what's currently happening? How do birth attendants currently understand quality care? And um, what change would they like to see? Why would they personally invest in the intervention? What's in it for them? Um, how does the community understand good care and how can the relationship between the facility and the community be strengthened? These are just a few questions that you might investigate with formative work. There are no doubt many others. So before I talk about positioning and supporting the nurse mentors, I want to talk about this picture and give you a story quickly, as quickly as I can, with this picture. So this is a nurse called Azrin. She's in working in a, a U, rural UP area in a hospital. She's, it's not a government hospital. It's, it's a hospital where I did observation for my PhD and I spent six, works, six weeks in this labour room. This labour room often had one nurse on duty, no phone, sometimes two nurses, maybe four women labouring. Um, and so sometimes they're by themselves. I was there to observe infection control practice and occupational health and safety of staff. So um, when I first went into that labour room, I would often see a nurse, maybe a nurse alone, wearing no protective equipment and often with one glove, not with two gloves. And so, you know, that's my first observation. But after spending time with these nurses and coming to understand better context, um, the story got richer. So in this particular morning when I took this photo, I went into the labour room and Azrin looked at me and said, oh, I knew you were coming, so I put on these, on, on, put this on, the gown and the gloves. Um, and so here she, and so she's got on a plastic apron under this green gown. She's not wearing a mask because no masks are supplied in this labour room. She's not wearing eye protection because the eye protection that was supplied was so cheap, it had scratches on it and she couldn't see to suture uh, the episiotomy or draw up the drugs. The gloves she's wearing are recycled gloves. They take them off and they wash them and soak them in sodium hypochlorite, sterilise them, and then they use them until one day they go to do a vaginal examination, the gloves tear. This is UP in the summer. In the six weeks I was there, the temperature was over 40 degrees every day. In this labour room, there's one overhead fan. And so there's no electricity, it goes off. So she had gowned up, as she thought I expected her to do, and waiting for this woman to deliver, but the woman was a bit slow in delivering and the electricity is gone and it's very hot. So she's starting to sweat and she's sitting down because she's going to faint with all of this gear on that she's supposed to have. So I guess that, you know, the message is even she's a great nurse, she's a great birth attendant, but even the best of intentions, if the system doesn't support her and make it possible for her to do her job properly, it's very difficult. So back to positioning and supporting the nurse mentors. So in our comparative process evaluation data collection, it's pretty clear the nurses, the birth attendants and the health facility staff like the nurse mentors. They're well regarded, they're valued, and of course there were teething problems in many places because the nurse mentors are young and less experienced, but they like them. They're, they're well received and they like their approach. It wasn't just the role, the approach of the nurse mentors was highly valued. And so, I, you know, some of our preliminary lessons learned might be that ongoing appointment endorsed by government is probably necessary. Clinical practice is dynamic, it's organic, it's not static. So it's no good thinking how long do we need to be there to bring about change, because then there'll be other changes that need to happen. So it has to be part of a quality improvement process that's ongoing. Um, 
And the mentors themselves, of course, have to be supervised and supported, and skills building of the birth attendants is essential. The nurses also really liked the checklists and case sheets, those sort of job aids, and, and you know, definitely positively endorsed them. They said it gave them confidence that they were doing the right things in the right order and things weren't being missed. Um, and also, so several mentioned about, if anything goes wrong, this I can show people, this is what I'm supposed to do and this is what I've done. So there was some accountability that, the, that those job aids gave them. However, there is definitely more work needing to be done for the, to really be being, for, to really allow these job aids to be used meaningfully. Because, you know, just filling out the checklists well after the delivery is completed is not how it's really meant to be. OK, the enabling environment. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because you all know it so well inside out and back the front about the infrastructure things. Um, but the nurses can't do all of this on their own. They need the leadership. We've talked to many people have mentioned that, especially the MOIC role. The leadership needs to demand it of the nurses and support them to do it. And everybody should be accountable. It shouldn't be the nurses trying to organise the pharmacists to order the drugs. It shouldn't be the nurses trying to get the MOIC to print the checklist time and time again. It's everybody should be accountable, not just the nurses. And a respectful environment for everyone, including the nurses. So nurse representation at senior level, they should be spoken to respectfully, listened to, listened to paid on time. A lot of these nurses haven't been paid for three to six months and then we wonder why they extort money from patients. Um, and the occupation, their occupational health and safety has to be taken seriously. Quite a few of the nurses shared with us concerns about the biomedical waste management, which was easy to see, not very good. Um, and their physical safety, they, you know, if, pa if patients' families got angry, etc. An effective referral system, once again, it's really um, uh, supporting what many people have said this morning. So engagement with referral facilities, district hospitals to improve the quality of care there is really essential because that's where the life-saving interventions should be available and sometimes are available. And most patients experiencing complications are ultimately managed in these settings and it's probably where most deaths occur. I'm not going to go through the list of what needs to happen for referral because you know that and I know Sunita's going to ring the bell. Um, the last point I wanted to make, and probably the most difficult point from some people's perspective, is doctors are essential, but they're absent. And getting so, so you know, nurses can't save lives alone. Occasionally, nurses can save lives alone, but really, doctors need to be there. And here's a quote from one of the nurse participants: "Doctors do not go to meet the patient. Suppose the patient has a PPH, and we inform this to the doctor, then they will instruct from there to refer them." or give them a drip, et cetera, but they will not come to meet the patient. The patient with a complication needs to be assessed by a doctor. The doc sometimes the nurses can't give antibiotics or Magsolf because it has to be a doctor's order, and in some places, the doctors actually have to give the Magsolf. So, you know, the doctors are important and they need mentoring. They need to know what evidence-based practice is. They need to come into the labour room. Uh, they need to be resourced. They also need to be resourced uh, for practice, and uh, they need to take timely action. And these are my last two points, but I'm not going to talk to them. I just wanted to make, put them up there as well. The other things is engaging with the communities and with the frontline workers, the ARSHAs in particular, because the ARSHAs are the ones who bring the women into labour. Uh, I'm sorry, don't bring them, to, bring them into the hospital when they're in labour, and they're the ones who escort them home. So both of those factors can be influenced by the ARSHA, and strengthening postnatal care is the other point. So thank you for listening. I got it in the 10 minutes, and uh, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. And it's my indeed, it's my indeed a proud privilege to invite uh, Dr. Budbul Sooth, uh, a great mentor of, uh, of many of us, uh, a public health professional with more than 40 years, is it? Mm, and was the professor of preventive and social medicine in Delhi's medical college for 23 years. Uh, she's Japago's uh, country director since 2009. Um, Ma'am, you have spent a lot of years uh, in mentoring different uh, strata of public health professionals. Uh, you had been involved in implementing the quality improvement stuff. Now, 
with regard to the public health sector what additional people focused interventions are needed to boost the effectiveness and mentoring and coaching this may include pre service training induction training leadership performance management everything what is missing right now what more needs to be done thank you thank you very much uh, devendra and i think you know after such uh, you know illustrious speakers and uh, experience of the better birth program and nurse mentoring uh, uh, everyone in this room i think is aware of a lot of things which needs to be done i think i'll just add some of the things which we feel will further strengthen so there is no doubt as if you've heard that you have to enhance the skills of the providers the mentoring helps and the evidence was there that that uh, leads to improvement in the practices uh, at the intervention sites i think i'll just uh, like to add that uh, uh, what we have to also ensure that you have to have a motivated and empowered provider at the facility level and i think you have heard this earlier also people speak about it i'll uh, share some of the experiences and i th i think it's not i'm not talking about a training one you know one training of motivation or one training for empowering it is a way it is, has to be institutionalized and how we do it and uh, from our experience of working in both the public sector facilities in the country and also with the private sector i would say this is very very important so the clinical skills is very important knowledge is important but we have to have our, um, uh, the the providers empowered and uh, motivated and uh, uh, this can be done it's not difficult but it has to be done in a planned way so i'll give you some examples of uh, uh, you know what we were able to do and uh, and the results were there uh, one was that when you do the orientation for you know quality improvement i think you have to involve everyone and when i say everyone it is from top to bottom and all the providers so the doctors the nurses the medical superintendent the obgyn whoever is there at that facility has to be there and what we found that and i remember that initially when you do this orientation you know the nurses would be sitting on one corner one side and the doctors on the uh, uh, moic on other side but you have to ultimately it is a team which works you just heard you know the last week michelle said you know doctors are needed nurses are needed we have to and 80% of our providers you know who are providing these services are nurses so we can't have one mass of people totally not powered to do certain things uh, we uh, the knowledge and skills definitely empowers you so again we found that in our experience when we explain why for example i'm giving example max self you know we all know that if there is a preeclampsia if you give max self in time it will save woman's life uh, initially there was a resistance even from the doctors to give max self and everybody is always oh, very dangerous you can't do this will happen that will happen and i remember in rajasthan we were having a discussion where we used to do this frequently call all the participating uh, facilities to have experience sharing experience sharing helps because you know you also learn by this process i did this the somebody so oh, i did this you know and then you find solution within the system because ultimately it is a systems approach that you have to take to you know uh, come out with solutions uh, we found that you know and this this was a uh, situation where there was a panel and it was all the panelists were the nurses and they were talking about their experience of managing preeclampsia and they said you know this is what have when we diagnose this we this is we, we give a max health and we refer the patient to the appropriate place and someone from the you know the the audience was doctors they said you don't know how dangerous this drug is this is what happens this was you know and uh, so then we very calmly said but madam this is not dangerous because if it is given in the appropriate dose and it's not going to kill the woman you have to and you you first give the load. we are only giving we are allowed to give loading dose we give the loading dose and we refer the woman and the woman then goes to the appropriate place and then it is taken care and then of course you monitor also so what i'm trying to say is somewhere you have to 
empower the nursing facility, uh, the, uh, the people in the nursing staff to, you know, come out and have their voices. And I found again, this was not, we didn't have a separate training, but what we did was that to bring them together and start talking and working as a team to say that, yes, this is a, you know, we have to, what is ultimate aim is to uh, improve the quality with the aim to decrease the neonatal mortality or stillbirth or maternal mortality or morbidity. So I think somewhere we have to systemize this. The second thing which we also found that, you know, uh, you know, sharing is very, very important, as I said. And I think that is something which is missing. So when we have the facilities who are participating, if you have the sharing more often, I think it comes out, people themselves come out with the solutions. And that is what encourages, and there is a healthy competition which also gets in. Uh, in terms of, uh, again, I, and I would refer to this, this was not only the public sector, but even the private sector where we started working with the MSD for Mothers support in uh, uh, two states. We found that almost 150 facilities that we were working in the private sectors, it was the, the doc initially the doctors were saying, what are you going to tell us? We already know. But then when they realized there were a lot of things which were missing, or some of the practices were outdated, or some of the things which were they were doing were unnecessary or maybe more harmful, and this you know, and they realized that the nurses were getting empowered. And I heard a lot of doctors say, "No, I can now uh, sleep peacefully because they are there, they are in power, they can manage, and when they is required, we can you know be called." So I think that harmonization of the 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 all the people who are working and. And somewhere the, with the medical superintendent or whether it is the, the, the CMO in the public sector or the district person, if they take, you know, more, uh, I would say, looking at the data and analyzing data and using the data, it will be useful. Uh, the pre-service education, the Vinda said, is very, very critical. I think we have to start in the, the you know, in the nursing schools and the medical schools, the, if we want to bring the change of the quality, we can't, you know, keep doing the unlearning un, and then uh, put those uh, quality issues, uh, whether it is, and I'm talking in terms of quality, it is, you know, patient care, respectful care, you know, making sure that you communicate with them, uh, you know, uh, be empathizing with the patients. I think that I, I some, sometimes find those things are completely missing. We don't even talk about how to empathize with them. You don't have to sit there for 20 minutes and talk to them. Even a simple, just a hand on a shoulder helps a woman, you know, to come out. And listening. I think somewhere we are, we are stop listening. So I would say that those are the things which are very important. The other uh, thing which I see in terms of innovation is technology. Technology today can be very, it's an additive. It can help the, you know, the facilities, the providers to perform better. And again, uh, we are in fact right now working in about four districts, uh, each in uh, Rajasthan and uh, 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 Madhya Pradesh. You look at how the technology can help, again, facilitate some of the things. For example, if there are point of care diagnostics, they can be linked. If there are the case sheets, you know, you are filling the case sheets now. If it can be digitized, you know. So if you are recording the blood pressure, and if there, there's also, uh, you know, alter uh, the, uh, the, you know, you can say, okay, this is, if it is more than this, this is what you do. Link up these case sheets and uh, data to uh, a remote center. And the, from the remote center, you know, you can ask for, you know, demand on demand, you can ask for their help. So I think these are the things we, as we move forward, they would help. But again, the, the communication part, the empathizing part, you know, the respectful care needs to be built in, in the pre-service education. And I think that is something where we are not invested enough. Work has started, but you know, we need to do more. And I would just stop here. Thank you very much.